Hey everybody, uh, back with another video, this time in front of the camera, not too common for me, but typically with my stuff, you're getting the opinion and perspectives of somebody that likes music a lot, but is just kind of some guy. And today we're lucky enough to be joined by a real pro, and so if you could give yourself sort of a professional introduction of you and your accolades or whatever. Oh, my accolades. <laughs> we have time. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. So my name's Dave Narciso, and uh, I'm a drummer, and I was kind of still am in a band called Throwing Muses that started uh, out of high school in 1983-84. Um, did maybe eight or nine records. Mm -hmm. um, one just came out last year. So, so that's me. A real professional, a uh, long time in the biz, still going and toured around the world. There's a famous story. Oh, and this is the funny part of this connection is that while Dave is a famous drummer, he's also like my friend's dad. And so this is how... This initial connection began because this is the guy that would, like, pick me up from sleepovers and stuff. <laughs> but So it's a weird casual, but also it's going to be nice to get very real answers from someone who has plenty of experience. And I remember the famous story that I remember most from, like, hearing childhood throwing music stories is that there was a monkey in a music video. Yes. Uh, on a record called University, we had a song called Bright Yellow Gun, and we did this video... And it's kind of set in like a dive bar, sort of slash drag bar. And part of it was, so we're, so like Bernie, the bass player, and I are dressed up in like kind of Vegas y suits. And we play poker with this chimp. Mm. So they had like a chimp wrangler. I think there were two chimps. So the chimp wrangler there, and the, it was crazy, crazy because they're like, they're, you're sitting there playing with them, and it's like, the chimp wrangler comes over and says, "Do not look them in the eye." So you like it was kind of scary actually yeah. for a while because they were they they put the fear of death in you, but they're like, "Don't look them in the eye." So we're playing the cards and it's like anytime you would look at the chimp, it would just jump into your arms and hug you. It was the most incredible, incredible experience. Was that like, "Don't look him in the eye because he will hug you"? Yes, okay. but then he had his mom. So Ike ended up, my son ended up actually getting some of the hand-me-downs from the little chimp. Oh, wait, like his clothes? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because they were like, oh, we don't need these anymore. Um, but the, his mother was on set. And I, I can't remember why, because I don't remember there being she a second chimp. She had to drop him off. Chimp. Yeah. <laughs> so they were, what they worried about was that if we were interacting with the, with the young, with, what was his name? What was the Murray. If we were interacting with Murray, they were afraid that the mother would get mm. upset and rip your face off. I think it's basically what they told us. Yeah, which seems very possible. Yeah. And so a guy that's held a monkey, or not held a monkey, but have embraced with a monkey for a music video, he's going to have plenty of answers for us. And so <laughs> today uh, what we're going to do, I asked for Twitter questions, and you were good in giving me some Twitter questions. And I've sort of done them chronologically that – with sort of how we can go from early days stuff to what you think about modern stuff. Yeah. That's sort of how I've tried to frame it. And so we'll begin with at reanimated LFC wants to know, did you put all your eggs into the basket of the band becoming successful? Did you have any decent backup plans or would you have just ended up in a dead end job if the band didn't get big? For me, it's kind of interesting because I, I wasn't really headed toward this. Kristen and Tanya, who were the, the, the songwriters in the band, I think this was like their trajectory. And I think I was a senior in high school when I got a call from Kristen. I'd known him since elementary school. And she was like, we, our drummer quit. We're recording tomorrow. So can you fill in? So I, I jumped in to do the demo, but I didn't really have any plan to do it long term. And then once I got in there and like saw what they were doing, it felt, you know, it's kind of one of those things and when you're in the moment, you kind of go, I think this is, I think this is really good. Yeah. But you, you're not sure if your perspective is right. And then it just kind of blossomed. And I, I went to college and then 
we were playing on the weekends and by the end of my freshman year, it started to look like things were going to happen. We were starting to get label interest from independent labels. So at that point, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't my long-term plan. It just kind of... What was the original plan? I didn't really have one. Yeah. So it's weird. Like as a parent, it's weird because you're like, I don't know. I just... <laughs> things happen. This thing just landed in my lap mm -hmm. and, and uh, I don't really know what I would have done if I had to actually make a choice. I think when I was in a freshman in college, I remember going to see my advisor and him going like, you seem to be leaning towards like history or English. And I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. I, I had no plan mm -hmm. at all. Um, and then, like I said, so I left, we went to Boston and then we were signed to 4AD, which is an independent label in mm -hmm. London. Um, I think within that year and then Warner Brothers the following year. So I kind of just went along for the ride and yeah. then did get a little bit sort of dropped off at the end with a little bit of like, what do I do now? Mm. But that's another story. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Kristen and Tanya were, Ta uh, Kristen especially was, if I don't do this, I don't know what I'll do. Mm -hmm. Tanya may be a little less so, but, um, but it was definitely there. They were driving the train mm -hmm. and I took a seat. I, 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 it's like the lottery. Like all of a sudden it was yeah. just like these two songwriters who happened to be my friends since I was a kid people really cared about what they were doing mm -hmm. and really felt like what they were doing was was special so it just didn't take a lot of planning that part didn't take a lot of planning from on my part yeah uh at the minto wants to know what was it like being in your scene at the time not just in terms of the music but all of you guys as people and the circumstances of that time and so to sort of give this context the way that i phrased asking for Twitter questions. I didn't say I'm interviewing Dave Narciso of Throwing Muses, this band from blah, blah, blah. I wanted it to be more so meta yeah, music yeah. questions that could be applicable to a lot of people, but that a professional could give a really thoughtful answer for. And so your specific scene was mainly 80s, 90s, DIY, alt-rock. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a scene we were in I mean, it, it, you know, everybody sits in a different seat, you know, in terms of your age. Or you can have a different perspective of what came before. And mm -hmm. we were right at the moment when what became called alternative was just about to break through. Mm. And actually not, not really just about to. When we started, it still had a little ways to go. But it was a, all the music we listened to was, I don't know if I even had any perspective on whether it was big. Mm. But popular music was just not something that it was a different thing. It was like a different, it was like carpentry or so. I don't know. It was just like yeah. a different <laughs> thing because it was all just like, you know, stuff that now I think maybe I have some appreciation for, but back then it just didn't feel like anything that I would, would ever listen to. But there was this huge scene, underground scene, I guess, um, that I think got big enough that it then eventually spilled over. Mm -hmm. We were part of a Providence scene for a little while. Had a lot of bands our age doing, I mean, the stuff that Kristen did was, and Tanya was just, was very different, but in, for the most part, um, similar stuff. Then we went to a Boston scene and we were so young that we couldn't really socialize because <laughs> like we like used to play freshman the, in college, we used to play the rat. So we were like 19. So we'd mm. play the rat in Boston and they'd make us wait outside until it was our time to play because we weren't old enough to be in there. So we didn't go to a lot of shows. And um, so there was a community, but it, I didn't feel as much a part of it until we got older. Mm. And there was a recording studio there called Fort Apache and, and that a sort of scene galvanized around that. And then like the Pixies came along and then we ended up, so we had the same manager. We both got signed to 4AD. So it was that Boston connection. Correct me if I'm wrong. The Pixies opened for you yes. one time. Yeah. Yes. Um, lots of bands opened for us. Mm. <laughs> and then soared back. <laughs> um, 4AD, in a lot of ways, I feel like was our biggest community. Mm. It was the most like you were around other bands. Like when we'd go and play in London, you know, other bands from the label would come. You'd go see their shows. It, it, that's the most I ever felt like part of a, a musician community was, was under 4AD. And did it feel friendly or was there like a sense of competition? Okay. No, super friendly. Like it was, again, it was still before the sort of promise of 
the mainstream business was just so beautifully out of reach mm -hmm. for all of us. It wasn't like, even in the picture. No one yeah. thought about it. Like you didn't, I'm not sure what our goals were, but it was Whitney Houston and Hall and & Oates. And mm -hmm. like, you were just like, we don't fit in there at yeah. all. You know, when we were going around, when we were uh, talking to major labels, when we, before we got signed to Warner Brothers, the question we'd ask all of them is like, who do you have that's like us? Mm -hmm. And like one of the labels was like, we think Bruce Hornsby is a lot like you guys. Like we just, it was yeah. just like <laughs> no. <nothing. laughs> But I think probably once that sort of like it broke through, mm -hmm. I'm sure there was competition. There just was something inherent in what we were doing that it was never going to be like the Sundays. I don't know if you know them, but they're another band that opened for us and like just like very commercial friendly. Because your music isn't particularly like catchy and it's mm -hmm. like a lot of mental health driven and so... Sort it's of. interesting because it's based on a lot of maybe older pop structures. Mm. You know, it's not so avant-garde, but you have this front person who will just scream. Mm. And back in 1984, 85, there were punk rock bands like that. But for the most part, it was something kind of different. And because mm. it, it predates Riot Girl, it predates like a lot of that stuff. So it was off putting to people so i think we always kind of knew how far we could get you know i mean and nobody doesn't want the most um but i think we always knew it was gonna be semi-limited at elsa carreras wants to know what do you think is missing from today's alternative scene and or something cool in today's alt scene that you wish was more prevalent in your era well that's a great question in the alternative scene now there's uh, a respect for pop that mm. didn't really exist. Although it's funny because culturally, like going to England was such a learning experience for us because they would call Jesus and Mary Chain pop. And they had a much different sensibility about like what was considered pop. Mm -hmm. So like Kate Bush, like a pop idol, but that to yeah, us, that yeah, might yeah. be so weird. Yeah. So it was so, but whereas the American underground scene or college rock scene was almost anti-pop like mm. it was just you that's you did not want to be that and i find like a lot of stuff today there's a, a kind of an unpretentiousness about how they approach a lot of play mm. with a lot of things like things that like we our hatred of it inspired us like just that mm. just just there was just like stuff going on in 80s pop that was so it hurt our feelings yeah. you know we were just like oh come on it's just it was as dated the day it came out, as it sounds yeah. now. But I hear people, like even Connor Oberst, will like play with 80s pop stuff that you, you almost like it's like they're talking to a person that hurt you when you mm. were a kid. And you're like, oh, but I'm starting to appreciate that. Like that, that they're, they're far enough removed from it that they can play with it without it like mattering. Mm -hmm. in a way. This is something that I sort of bring up on the channel a lot is that there's a lot of gatekeepy feelings within like music nerd sort of communities. And so with my channel, I like to present everything on like a similar level. And so I like to praise like the Carly Rae Jepsen's and Ariana Grande's of the world who have incredible yeah. music and also talk about whoever in the same vein of just like enjoying stuff. And so I really like that answer of like pop in alt not being so separated. And, and to that question, yeah, that that's one thing that I feel like is different. There's a little bit more cross pollination. Bon Iver being on a Taylor Swift record and mm. stuff like it that that wasn't happening in my day. Like yeah. it it wasn't there wasn't a, as much mutual respect. Mm. Uh, at Ziggy Bastard, I'm probably going to blur that out. Uh, has the overall sound of the band influenced their style or the other way around? Did the aesthetic and your personalities create the sound of the music or did the sound of the music influence your style? I think probably the sound came first. Mm. But the sound was also based on what we loved. Mm. Like we wanted to be X. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're mm. an L.A. punk band. That's who we wanted to be. And in that great like what I think makes a lot of great bands or music is being 
shitty at copying somebody else. Mm. Like that's when it really uh, you end up with something new. Yeah. If you're really good at copying somebody, it, it's you know you can do that really well. It can be impressive, but we wanted to sound like X, and we didn't really know how. Something to. else happened. Something else happened. Yeah. Exactly. So, and I think my drumming because I started as a marching drummer. Mm -hmm. When I started with them, I'd never played a drum kit, so I was very percussive. And that, I think, added something kind of sort of accidental. I also, the first drum kit that I borrowed for that first demo that we did, the mm -hmm. guy who lent me the kit had lent his cymbals out to somebody else. So you just didn't have cymbals. So I just didn't have cymbals. And I was learning to play the kit without them. So when I bought my first kit, I just didn't buy any cymbals. Mm -hmm. And then, then that became kind of a signature yeah. that I didn't have cymbals. Because in like researching throwing muses, it's, muses, it's like... Dave Narciso's iconic lack of symbols and whatnot, but it's like just out of necessity. Out of necessity, accidental. And the funny thing is the first producer we ever worked with on the first album, you know, we were so young and, you know, we were kids and this producer comes in and we were really compliant. Um, and he was just like, what? No. <laughs> yeah. So he was, so he had me overdub symbols so they're on wow. the, pretty much every record has symbols on it, mm -hmm. but I then I went out on the road and didn't have any. So yeah. I would use the um, the hi hat for crash ride everything. Mm. Um, I don't think I got one until 1990. So the first record came out in '86. That's really and I got my first symbol in like 1990. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that says something about like not needing to be so perfect when you're starting out and creating to just. It's kind of like, in a way, it's kind of like, you know, runners that train in high altitudes because symbols forgive a lot of sins. Like mm. when you're, when you're at point A and you got to get to point B, you, if you don't, a symbol will gloss over a lot of transitions and just make them sound really dramatic. Mm. And when you don't have that, you got to get from point A to point B in an interesting way and everything has to be tight. Yeah. Um, so it was... I remember when I first got one, I remember that feeling of like, oh, this wow, is easy. This is easy. <laughs> yeah. like I could just make a loud noise and yeah. move to the next part. That's funny. Um, at Lean 5 Real, just very general, any interesting unreleased music or stories about the band in general? Anything that sticks out? Kristen is very prolific. Mm. So every record, in fact, so Tanya in 1991 left the band and she formed a band called Belly. And then also... Kim Deal from the Breeders formed the Breeders with Tanya. Um, when we would make records, Kristen would come in with like 20 songs and Tanya would have two. And so Tanya's two songs would go on the record and then Kristen would, would pare down hers to the remaining, whatever that is, eight or nine. Mm -hmm. That just went on and on and on until we made a record called The Real Ramona in 1990. And all of a sudden Tanya showed up with 20 songs. And so... That that was when the basically the conversation had to happen of how many songs are we? Well, whose band is this? Okay, um, and I don't think anybody was hiding it. I mean, Kristen was like, "That's not that wasn't really no." Yeah. So she took her songs, and they were gonna be the next Breeders record, and then they became Belly Records. But anyway, so the thing I can answer is like, there are some ones. There are a lot that got away, like a lot that got away. And they became other band songs, or they're just gone? No, the stuff that Kristen wrote that didn't make it onto the album, mm -hmm. that just, some of them got recycled over the years. Mm -hmm. Tanya's songs all became belly songs. Gotcha. Um, but there's, there's some Kristen songs that, like there's one in particular that was, it was epic. It was like a nine minute song, and it was incredible. Is there and like I, can't, any... I used to have like a, a cassette practice tape of it. Uh-huh lost it and sands of time yeah so that's just so there's that one but then there there were always just a bunch that would just fall by the wayside mm. hey so that's going to conclude part one of this two-part interview slash questions with a pro video big thank you again to dave for doing this this is a really new thing for me but i think it was really cool really exciting a whole lot of great insight and part two will be up this monday the 13th and so be on the lookout for that if you enjoyed part one. Uh, thank you again. See ya. Hey, thank you for watching that video. If you want to support the channel, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media at RenshawHS. You can buy my merch, support my Patreon, and thank you again. I'll see you soon.